where exactly that tree is. Um, so the land was all included in the historic St Albans um, road stud. And if you do look at page 18, you can see where that heritage inventory um, covers the site and that area where the tree is located. That's page uh, 18, I think. You see that part that's blue on the plan there? That's where the, that corresponds with where the tree is and some of the surrounding area where they think the horses um, So there is a covenant on this land. Uh, it prohibits subdivision unless approved by the responsible authority. So that covenant um, means that someone who wishes to subdivide needs to apply for a planning permit. And the planning permit is the process to uh, gain approval to subdivide the land. So this isn't in breach of a, per, of a restriction. It's not in breach of the covenant. They're not removing the covenant by seeking a planning permit. That's the way um, to gain approval by the responsible authority. And I think you'll see on your, your desk as well, there's um, legal advice that's being provided by the applicant, and that's from Maddox Lawyers. Uh, and that just confirms um, that that is the case, that the way to get approval from the responsible authority, the council, is to seek a planning permit, uh, which is what is before us tonight. So if you look again at the site plan, you'll see that lot one is just over 1,000 metres squared, and lot two will be 2,487 metres squared. Uh, lot two will be the larger lot, and that will contain the existing dwelling, and it will contain, contain that significant. There's an easement proposed. Uh, if you look in at the bottom corner, you can near the tree, you'll see E2, easement two. That's already existing on title, and that's, that's near the significant tree. E1 is easement one, and that's on the opposite corner, down the bottom of the page and that's existing on title as well. So the new easement, the one that's proposed, is easement E6, and that's 2.5 metre wide, uh, and it runs along the boundary. So that's the proposed easement. And you can see looking at that plan that that easement is the opposite side to the tree. So the area that this land is in is zoned general residential schedule one. There's no minimum lot size in this zone. And if you have a look at page 37 of the report, you'll see where it's located and see some of the lot sizes uh, in the area. So on the, it's figure eight on page 37, uh, you'll see I've highlighted the subject site and all the other lots I've highlighted in blue, they're all the lots that are over 1,000 metres squared. And it's just important to note that both these lots will remain over 1,000 metres squared. So that's where it sits within the site. And you can see just to the north, the more typical uh, residential lots, smaller lots to the north. Um, there's some diversity in lot sizes there. You can see some smaller lots scattered throughout and some larger lots to the north as well. So this application um, went to public notification. Letters were sent to the owners and occupiers. There was a sign on site and we received 45 objections. There was also one petition. The petition was a change.org petition, an online petition, and it was tabled, stop developers from destroying this historic tree with links to Farlap. Uh, so that petition um, was dealt with in that um, an easement running along the, uh, where the tree is. There was an easement proposed along where the tree is and then it was changed following public notification after the objections and the petition were received. It was swapped to the other side of the land and you can see it now running along the, um, that south boundary there. That's E6, and that has been moved away from the tree following the petition and following the objections. Uh, there were other um, reasons for objection. 
Um, concerns about where the horses are buried on site, the proposed lot size, neighbourhood character, drainage, vegetation on site and also the covenant. Was assessed against uh, was assessed by council's engineering unit, also the waste unit. Um, our heritage advisor, um, also Heritage Victoria, went out there and then decided to include the tree in that area um, in the heritage inventory. Um, they were all supportive of the application. They've provided conditions, but otherwise no concerns. They're supportive of it. Uh, the proposal has been assessed against the municipal planning strategy and planning policy framework of the planning scheme including Clause 56, Residential Subdivision, where it complies with all those planning uh, scheme requirements. The subdivision provides for one additional residential lot within an existing residential area, and it creates land that can be de developed in accordance with the city's urban growth and housing policy objectives. It remains a large lot, it's 1,000 metres squared. Um, so it's it assists in consolidating the existing urban fabric. It makes use of existing urban infrastructure. And it also provides a diversity of lot sizes to accommodate the varying housing needs of the community. And can support, the, can support development which is in keeping with the area. It's serviced by the required infrastructure and doesn't result in any unacceptable off-site amenity impacts or overload the carrying capacity of relevant services. Therefore, having considered all the relevant requirements of the planning scheme and the objections lodged, lodged against the proposal, it's recommended that the application be supported subject to those conditions. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Councillors, uh, questions for Emma at this stage? Councillor Mason. Um, thank you, Emma. I've, I've, uh, in reading the, the documents, I understand there's a, a drainage required through pumping and retention and a gravity drain, uh, especially, I think, in the, in the north. Um, that gravity drain flows to the, to the uh, cul-de-sac. Yeah, yeah, that's right. So our council engineers have provided those conditions and they're satisfied that this lot, this additional lot, that northern section, can be drained. It can... It can uh, um, so, could you explain further about uh, the requirement of retention and pumping in relation to that gravity drain? Yeah, I guess it's more of a, they would need to provide um, engineering plans and things to our engineers, um, but it's conditioned on the permit that it needs to be to the satisfaction of the responsible authority, so it needs to be the satisfaction of of council, um, but how they, the specifics of how they do it can often change. Um, so if we read the condition, that's as probably, that's about as much detail as I know as how they're actually going to do it, just how that condition's worded, which is at the start of the report. Um, so there's a condition two there, says the site must be drained to the satisfaction of the RA and no concentrated stormwater may drain or discharge from the land to adjoining properties. So it's conditioned there, so if there ever was a concern, it would come back to the planning permit. If they weren't in accordance with the planning permit, something would need to be done if it wasn't being treated uh, right. Um, so the next um, condition talks about that it needs to be designed and installed, so it's the stormwater discharge is not increased by the development. Um, so those things do come back um, to being a planning issue if there was enforcement or something required, if there was a, an issue with it. Uh, if you look at condition 11, prior to statement of compliance, so before it can get its separate title, um, it does say um, they need to pay and have constructed a separate connection via a pump system um, into a new drivable end wall in the swale on Oakwood Ridge. So they've given very specific condition there as to how they want to see that connected to the system. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions of Emma at this point? All right, thank you, Emma. Um, what I'm going to do is just briefly say that uh, this is a planning committee meeting, so it's about planning matters. So um, 
we won't be hearing uh, matters on any personnel to do with the staff at this point. So I just wanted to preface that with this is about a planning matter and we're here to deal with the planning matter at hand. So, um, you know, we've, we've seen everything that, that's sort of gone around us. This is particularly, and we're focused on this planning matter as a matter of planning. So um, I would like to call Kelly, Kelly Langdon. I'll get you to come up. Kelly's going to be proxy for quite a few. So Kelly's going to be here for a little while. So Kelly, after each uh, submission, let me know when you're finished. Um, we, we do have about three minutes per submission, so um, we'll ask you, and then we'll ask questions of that particular submission, if that's okay. So feel free to, to take a seat. Two, that's there three. Yep. Audio, so he's um, got three submissions in that nine minutes. That's fine. Yeah. Yep. So uh, let me just check for you. Um, Peter, we were going to play it from that particular microphone. Was that right? I'll sit down while that's playing and then I'll get up to... Councillors, just for your information. Or Councillors, just for your information, um, we did pre-approve the audio to come through to us so we could hear that. While John's getting that ready. Oh. All right, just while John's getting that ready. So um, what we try and do is have new matters raised by objectors. So thank you for allowing Kelly to go first and then you guys can come in after that. So thank you, John. You're ready to, to play that. Do you want to just put the mic down, sort of closer to the speaker, and then we can get that heard? Yeah. Make sure that microphone's on, John, because I don't think it's... Yeah. Just the microphone. There we go. Yep. I'm also presenting as a proxy for Janine Nell, who is overseas. I've lived at my property at 18 Freeman Court, St Norman's Park, for 30 years. I live at the property with my partner and my two adolescent children. Thank you for the opportunity to present my objection via a recorded message. I regret that I'm unable to attend tonight due to a family court ordered commitment. If you have any questions though concerning my objection, I'm available to speak on the phone immediately to answer your inquiries. I share a 70 metre boundary with the property proposed to be subdivided. The developer owner of the property which is proposed to be subdivided is the current City of Greater Geelong Director of City Services, Mr Guy Wilson Brown. The property has an existing covenant which prohibits further subdividing unless approved by the responsible authority. The responsible authority being council. The developer owner purchased the property in 2018 as an investment property. The developer owner applied to subdivide the property initially in 2019. This report was produced by the Council Internal Ombudsman on 8th of July 2019 regarding the history involved in the subdividing of this investment property. Currently, Council have refused to release this report voluntary through freedom of information. Currently, legal avenues are afoot for this report to be re released by council and for the report to be made transparent. This planning proposal 
has attracted substantial media coverage in The Age, Geelong Advertiser, Geelong Times and ABC Radio 774. It has attracted 45 objections and over 1,100 objection signatures on a change org petition in support of protecting the horse burials in the rear of the property and other aspects concerning this subdivision proposal. The objectors were only given five working days notice to attend this hearing tonight. The planning proposal put forward tonight does not satisfy many requirements. We've unanswered questions regarding. Therefore, the current proposal should be refused by council due to the following. Each inventory listed. The proposed subdivision works still affects the existing burials located in the rear of seven to eight Oakwood Ridge, the property to be subdivided. Notably, the proposed drainage and sewer works for the subdivision will affect the burials. The Heritage Act states, a person must not, without consent issued under section 124, knowingly or neglectantly deface, damage or otherwise interfere with or carry out an act likely to endanger A, a site recorded in the heritage inventory, or B, an archaeological site which is not recorded in the heritage inventory. We are aware that there exist horse burials across the whole rear yard of this property at 7 to 8 Oakwood Ridge. The planning report hasn't addressed this matter. Archaeological remains will be uncovered in the yard if sewer and drainage works are carried out as proposed in the planning report. This information is contained in my objections. First Nation artefacts. The planning report also does not address First Nation artefacts found in the area. This is a critical and important factor and a cultural heritage management plan is required for assessment but has not been produced by the owner developer. Existing covenant. The property at 708 Oakwood Ridge has an existing covenant which prohibits, prohibits further subdividing unless approved by the responsible authority. The responsible authority being council. Section 60.2 of the Planning and Environment Act 1987 <coughs> states, in according with section 62 of the Planning and Environment Act, council must not grant a permit if a beneficiary of the covenant is likely to suffer. A, a financial loss or B, loss of amenity or C, loss arising from change to the character of the neighbourhood or D, any other material detriment as a consequence of the removal or variation of the restriction. With the neighbourhood to suffer a loss if this permit is granted, Council should not issue a permit due to the following sufferance of the objectors. Loss of amenity suffered by neighbours. No environmental management plan has been provided outlining the effect the subdivision will have on the substantial existing native wildlife that lives in the existing trees on this property where Lot 1 is proposed, or the effect on the wildlife such as Australian magpies, pied currawong, black yellow tail and sulphur crested cockatoos, ibis, crane, stork, owls, bats, wallabies, hares, which regularly visit our properties and neighbouring properties. All the effects of propose, the proposal of the creation of Lot 1 will have on the vegetation that has taken 30 years to grow. The existing post and wire fencing is simply not suitable for medium density development. The post and wire fencing has been appropriate for low density living, but the developer's proposal of medium density living does not suit post and wire fencing. My cancer affected partner and at times my adolescent children, live in a council approved dependent persons unit, granny flat, on the property. The proposed development is to occur three metres from the approved dependent persons unit. This will affect my family's amenity due to the proximity of the proposed development works to the dependent persons unit and the disruption this will place on my family's recovery from illness. Loss arising from change to the character of the neighbourhood. The proposed Lot 1 property existing of 1,000 metres squared in size is surrounded by neighbouring properties three <coughs> times larger. With these surrounding properties being greater than 3,000 metres squared in size, this proposal is unprecedented in the neighbourhood 
and not consistent with the neighbourhood character. Design flaws. I'm employed by the state government with 30 years experience relating to sewer works and I have also worked in both the private and public sector relating to stormwater. Stormwater. The developer's proposed lot one does not contain a legal point of stormwater discharge. The proposal is to discharge stormwater from lot one in front of other neighbours' properties some distance down Oakwood Ridge. These neighbours are rejectors of the development. The developer proposes to pipe his stormwater across neighbouring driveways to discharge in front of other properties. This isn't a legal point of stormwater discharge. Stormwater detention. The residents have no confidence in stormwater detention as a neighbouring area is already prone to flooding and further stormwater will increase this occurring. My objections show the full extent of flooding in the past, which will result in the neighbouring property owners experience a further loss of amenity and also a loss arising from a change to the character of the neighbourhood, with an increase in stormwater flooding due to the creation of Lot 1. In accordance with Section 62 of the Planning Environment Act, Council must not grant a permit if a beneficiary of an existing covenant is likely to suffer. This is the case. Redesigning the court bowl in Oakwood Ridge from a hammerhead to a bowl. The current residents in Oakwood Ridge do not want their vehicle access altered. The residents are happy with the current cul-de-sac design. The cul-de-sac is called Oakwood Ridge due to the design of the cul-de-sac. The proposed court bowl, as shown in the planning report, would change the neighbourhood character and affect the neighbour's amenity. The cul-de-sac would then be more appropriately defined as Oakwood Court which the residents do not want. The residents' amenity is being affected by the design of a court bowl, which they do not wish for. The developer owner is the current director of city services in charge of council's drainage of private streets. With, above, with the above design flaws shown in the proposed management of the stormwater for this subdivision, despite the planning report indicating all is fine within, one questions the fairness of council planning's approval of this application. Sewer. The developer requires the approval from the owner of 17 Woods Road St Norman's Park to enter this property and construct a new sewer maintenance structure into the existing sewer reticulation in 17 Woods Road. The developer does not have this permission and connection of the new sewer reticulation to serve the proposed Lot 1 does not have a point of discharge into the existing sewer system. Considering all of the above, I encourage the councillors and associated committee members to view my planning objections to council thoroughly concerning this proposal. My objections are dated 22nd of April, 3rd of May, 28th of June, 2022, to obtain a complete overview of this proposal and proof of my explanation in this presentation, with the only logical, reasonable and fair result being for council to listen to the neighbourhood and reject this application. Thank you. Thank you for that. So that was um, Kevin's uh, proxy for both um, Meredith Deverna, uh, Jin Nell de Cocker, and himself. Uh, councillors, given that they're not here to answer the questions, we might go straight into the, to the submissions um, of the other uh, proxies and also Kelly's as well. So that will make it easier. Then we can ask Kelly some questions at the end. So. Thank you, Kelly. Uh, over to you, uh, you which, which one are you going to present next? Okay, I'm speaking on Sorry, do you want now. to bring your mic up just so we can just lift it up there and bring it forward to you if you like? Yeah, thank you. I'm speaking on behalf of Fernando Sorgiovanni, um, who's a resident of Oakwood Ridge and in fact lives right next door to the property. Right. Uh, Fernando is a long-serving COG employee who works in the City Services Division under the landowner, Guy Wilson-Brown. Fernando is a neighbour of his, the landowner's investment property, sharing a 70-metre boundary. Fernando has been through three and a half years of planning and litigation, resulting in stress and feeling very uncomfortable regarding this planning application. So I'll just read his uh, submission. We are the occupiers of the land at five to six Oakwood Ridge and Auburns Park and object to the grant of a planning permit in respect of planning permit application 3172022. There are two principal themes concerning why it would be unsound for council to recommend approval. These are process related and merits related. 
In relation to process, there are flaws that make the officer's report supporting the proposal unsound. Firstly, the officer report states no council officers have any direct or indirect interest in the matter to which this report relates. The owner of the land is a director of council. It is not possible to objectively form the view that no council officer has an interest in the way that it is expressed in this report. Secondly, the officer report fails to grapple with the issues raised by the objections. The summary before the planning committee is incomplete. Specifically, the report fails to address matters raised in our objections concerning, one, the fact that reliance on urban consolidation and benefits of increased housing are not relevant to the addition of a single dwelling. The report states that the application assists in the ensuring a diversity of housing opportunities in this area. Two, also the fact that the report recommended conditions that completely omit any reference to address controls to prevent the further subdivision of the land, i.e. the creation of the three lot subdivision that was previously withdrawn or building envelopes or the protection of the heritage tree. Instead, the report simply constructs an argument in favour of granting a permit. In relation to the merits of the proposal, the development will compromise neighbourhood character. The officer suggests that smaller lots exist 60 metres to the north. This is misleading. The diagram at figure one on page 14 of 52 of the agenda clearly demonstrates that the edges of the subdivision abutting the farming zone contain large lots while the internal lots in the subdivision are the small lots. This proposal breaks this pattern for no planning benefit. There are already adequate small lot areas to the north. The council planning scheme has identified areas for increased housing diversity at clause 16.01 1L.02. This part of Geelong is not included in one of these areas. Instead, the development should be consistent with the purpose of the zone to encourage development that respects the neighbourhood character of the area. The proposal does not manage drainage on the site. Instead, it kicks the can down the road under a section 173 agreement to be dealt with at some later stage. This is inappropriate and does not demonstrate a satisfactory approach. There are no building envelopes proposed, no controls on future development and no control on further subdivision. If there is a 173 agreement condition, why have these basic parameters not been included to prevent the destruction of the heritage tree and the construction of the dwellings inconsistent with the character? The approach to this application is piecemeal. The large lots in this area are utilised as lifestyle lots. We are registered dog breeders, we have trailers, we have animals, we have chickens and the like. The type of development that will follow is inconsistent <coughs> with this character. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very uh, much. Fernando, thank employee, you. long term employee of COG. Thank you, Kelly, and thank you, Fernando, for being here. Councillors, questions for Fernando? Councillor Maloney. I have a question arising from, from some of that that perhaps the officers can answer. Um, thank you so much for the submission and for being a proxy. I know it's, it's a very difficult thing to, to do, but yeah, well. <laughs> yeah. Um, with regard to the the report that uh, wasn't able to be released by Freedom of Information Act, um, I, I'd like to know a bit more about that. I think that was part of the the video. Um, can officers um, perhaps comment on that? Uh, with it was some sort of environmental report. Uh, uh, there was also a First Nations artifact. Um, disclosure there that hadn't been addressed. There was a Talking about a cultural heritage. Yeah, there's a, yeah, there's a bunch okay. of things in there that yeah, I, so I just a, need to... There's an yeah. Aboriginal... Um, there's nothing that shows where... Sorry, do you want to bring your mic a little bit closer? Where there are areas of um, cultural, Aboriginal cultural mm -hmm. sensitivity. Uh, this site isn't covered. Um, Along the river is, uh, 200 metres long waterways is um, a sensitive area, um, but this isn't covered by any um, sensitive areas. Uh, but further to that, the Aboriginal um, regulations do state that a two-lot subdivision is exempt from requiring a cultural heritage management plan. Um, yes, 
Um, and also to the uh, environmental report or the, the vegetation impact, is there any comment on that the, or the mm. lack of that? I know we do that for quite a few, few of these. Um, Not for a two-lot subdivision. I don't, there is an arborist report uh, regarding the large tree, mm -hmm. um, but there are no other environmental management reports, uh, no. I, my, I guess my last question, and this, um, I guess it's really hard for us to make a decision if it's all a bit fuzzy, but um, with regard to the, the flooding issue, the, the drainage, um, it, it, what, um, I guess, do you have any comment on what's being proposed and the remediation of that? I, I've read a bit about the vegetation and the, the mitigation there, but I just wanted you to perhaps Talking clarify about the fl About the flooding, flooding or yes. about, vegeta about yeah. flooding? Yeah. yeah, so I guess we rely on our engineers to look at the site, look at what infrastructure is around the site and let us know if it can be connected and how it needs to be connected and that forms conditions of the planning permit. So are it's, you confident that the, that is appropriate in its nature of the, the remediation of that, that flooding? Well, there's no, the, it's not covered by a flooding overlay. Um, there's nothing to say that this area floods uh, in a way that needs um, any remediation works or anything, but there are, you know, swale drains and um, it, they I, are large lots, I guess. Sure. Um, but I guess we rely on the council engineers to put conditions on the permit. Um, sorry, so Gerard. council yeah, does oh, stop for two seconds. Oh, sorry, we'll oh. ask you a question if we oh, need okay, to. If that's all right. In relation to that, because we live yeah. there, so we know of the flooding. Yeah, yeah. So but this is get these this, images. That's all. Let me I just, just clarify. Oh, yes, this is this sorry. forum for uh, is for us to ask questions. Oh, and, and now that's okay. <laughs> just so you're clear. Yep. So we'll let John finish that comment, and then we'll come back to Councillor Maloney. Yeah. In reference to flooding, Councillor Maloney. It comes on a hierarchy, so we get mapping done from the Carrangement Catchment Management Authority and also from our flood engineers. The hierarchy from the highest to the lowest is looking at a flood overlay, looking at a le and then coming down to what is called an LSIO, which is land subject to inundation overlay, then coming down to the next level, which is a special building overlay. They are recognised areas where flooding is known to occur based on mapping, and that is levels of flooding that can be quite severe. So if you're looking at areas around waterways in particular, the last area of flooding is covered under the building permit and under the building regulations. So regulation 132 covers flooding in the area. This site is not covered by any of those overlays and it's not covered by the regulations in the building. So it's considered to be a lower level and so their flooding isn't as much of an issue as what those areas would be mapped to be, be and where you would need to address them. When was that last flood study done? The last one done. I'd have to take that on notice and come back to the CCMA. Yeah, I can answer that. Um, so yeah, the CCMA, um, probably in 2018, did, a, did more flood mapping for the Lower Barwon and Mirable. It's actually, we're trying to implement that as part of Amendment C339, which has been to Council recently. So the flooding along the Barwon River is very well understood and the, the mapping's very up to date. Um, and it doesn't affect this site, but yeah, as the other planners were saying, um, there's different levels of flooding. I don't think riverine flooding is probably what even the residents are talking about. I think it's local stormwater related drainage more than flooding. So the engineers, it's a flat site. They want to make sure that the runoff on the site can escape the site to somewhere suitable. I'm aware yeah. of all that. I just yeah. wanted to know yeah. with respect to the amenity of the individuals living there. So yeah, that, okay. Thanks for the clarification. Thank you. Councillor Maloney. Um, I had a question then um, of Fernando, or uh, is, uh, so you're obviously, uh, a lot of people are, uh, are flood affected at the moment. Um, what would you say in the history of your site and the sites around here that your flood looks like at the moment? Would you like to just speak into the microphone? Sorry, thank you. Thank it you. does get uh, wet pretty quickly and um, the culverts in the street um, doesn't take much for them to uh, fill up pretty quickly and I, um, with the new property going in, if it goes ahead and <clears throat> the uh, rainwater going off the roof gets just distributed into the culvert, I could see flooding uh, occurring pretty quickly and easily. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Mason, did you have a question? Thank you, uh, Councillor Grisbeck. Uh, I just refer to the uh, to the recording, and um, 
statements regarding the sewer and the point of discharge and there being no uh, ready permission for access. Could you talk to that, please? For the question, Councillor. With regards of sewer for a two-lot subdivision, obviously Council doesn't control the sewer. They're not the authority for it. It needs to be referenced as it is in, I think, condition seven here at the moment. So it needs to be referred and approved as part of this development. Oh, pardon me, as part of this subdivision. So we wouldn't have any information and we're not required to refer it under the planning scheme for a two-lot subdivision, but we are required to make reference to it to make sure that that authority is referred to and has given consent. They give consent post a planning permit, not pre a planning permit for a two lot subdivision. Whilst we're on that subject then, can I ask, does a three lot subdivision require that? Okay, so because it was originally a three lot subdivision, it's now gone to two lot subdivision. That was the original, <coughs> three lots was the original Yes, what we're looking at here is just a straight two-lot subdivision. Two we're lot. not yep. thinking about, I guess, what was in the past. I'm just looking at what's before me. It's a two-lot subdivision. Yes. Yep. If it were three lots, it would go to um, the authority and they'd provide specific conditions. Um, but the a two-lot is exempt from needing that requirement. The original application that was exhibited out for public comment was a three-lot subdivision. Is that right? Uh, yeah, I believe Yes, so. and then it was changed post-objections. <coughs> right. Yep. Okay, just wanted to be clear about that. Application with withdrawn. Withdrawn, and, yeah. right. Thank you. Thank you for that clarification. Councillors, Councillor Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question's with regard to um, the voice, the recording we heard, and, and he said that um, there was uh, remains in the, in the easement. Is, is that right? So Heritage Victoria did go out there on site. Their archaeologists went out there, and to their... I guess best knowledge, they've applied this heritage inventory to the area where they think there may be horse remains, but they're not just looking at horse remains, they're looking at artefacts like you know whips or bridles or whatever, because that's what um, I guess gives it significance is people can say, well, what did they use back then? Um, and there could be DNA from the horses, all sorts of things, but they have nominated that area. Um, I don't think they've done a thorough you know, X-ray of the site or anything, but that that's the area that they wanted covered and included on that um, inventory. Um, heritage Victoria and the inventories don't look at in, in any indigenous cultural heritage. They're just looking at what might be in the ground um, and culturally significant. Um, and it, it, you know, there could be horses buried there with other artifacts and, and that's the area they've nominated. Um, yeah, this whole area was part of the um, St Albans Stud. There's actually another patch um, a little bit further away that they've identified that there may have been another tree there and another burial patch. So they've actually put um, a heritage inventory over that patch as well, but they weren't going to cover the whole, um, whole site. I guess they were satisfied with where they think the majority of these significant horses and um, artefacts may be buried. So, so question remains, it, on the easement, there's nothing there on the easement, is that what you're saying? Well, like I said, they didn't dig, dig it up and try, but where they think the remains will be is under tree. that tree, and that's what they've covered okay. here. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. All right. The tree is not going to be removed, is that right? No, no, the tree is not going to be removed, um, and no work, no new works are required near that tree. Protected, is that Nelson, right? can you just speak into your Sorry. microphone? And Sorry. that tree is now protected, is that right? Not <laughs> under any type of planning requirement, um, but under the heritage inventory, yes, they wouldn't, they've wouldn't. got their own procedures, but the landowner, if they're wanting to do any works near that tree or in that whole area, they'd need to get in touch and, and um, request consent. Any works within that area. It's not a planning issue anymore. Heritage it, issue. It's heritage, yeah. heritage Victoria who... Yeah. who Thank you. All right, thank you, Fernando, for your submission. Thank you. Um, Kelly, we're going to, is it Brendan that you're going to go for next? Is that right? Um, Brendan oh, Hicks of Freeman Court, Trevor Elliott of Wilsons Road, Susan Arclay of Langer Drive, and myself, our presentations are combined. So we go through a number of grounds, including sewer, drainage, streets, covenant, conflict of interest, let, let me just um, be so clear. So there's a number of number of things, but we've combined our thoughts into one. So uh, you got one submission to read for yeah, on several. On behalf of the four of us, I'll try not to repeat what someone else has said. Right. But I, 
I may have, I apologise in That's all right. if I do. All right, let's <coughs> start with that one then. Thank you. Okay, thank you for the opportunity to talk tonight. Um, I would like to say I am disappointed that there aren't any Brownville Ward councillors present because obviously they um, represent the objectors. Um, now, I already covered this for Fernando, but it's quite an important point. The agenda report says no council officers have direct or indirect interest, which is blatantly untrue and misleading because the landowner is the director of city services, Guy Wilson Brown, which I'm sure everyone here knows, but I just wanted to point that out. Senior council officer with direct interest in this matter. Another important question I'd just like to raise at the get-go, I would like to know if any of the officers here tonight or mentioned in the report uh, agenda for this evening have ever provided planning advice, whether verbal or written, to the landowner, Guy Wilson-Brown, in regards to this private planning subdivision? And if so, I'd like them to declare their conflict of interest now. Well, I've already asked the, is if there's any conflict of interest and there's been none, so okay. we'll take that as submission. Thank you. That is there as the answer. Um, <clears throat> agenda item 1.4, though, is about conflict of interest. Uh, we have been advised that at least one officer listed on the agenda report um, has been mentioned in the internal ombudsman's report regarding this subdivision, which is obviously subject to a VCAT hearing at present. Um, we've tried to uh, get it through regular means, through council, through FOI, it was rejected. We went through um, other means. We're now at VCAT regarding the internal ombudsman's, ombudsman's report, tongue twister, written in July 2019. So I would like to request again that anyone who has given that advice say so now, but if not, uh, obviously I can't, I can't make them. We'll go back to the planning matter in front of us now. Kelly, if you want to give us your submission, okay. that would be good. My question is why the developer landowner has received preferential treatment over other ratepayers, uh, because um, we wonder, given you would have seen today's newspaper article, um, he has used council resources to um, discuss planning applications in the past. Has he used council resources to question um, staff about his private subdivision? That is a question that I would like to know the answer to. Maybe I will never know, but I'm hoping. There are serious governance matters alive in relation to this matter. This includes community awareness about the internal ombudsman's review. If COG are committed to openness and transparency, this matter should not be subject to a VCAT FOI request. Why is a decision on planning being made while this VCAT FOI request is afoot? There is a hearing pertaining to a report which may implicate an officer. There has not been transparency in the planning process and we want to know where is this report and why is it being kept a secret? Why has council not managed the perceptions of conflict by seeking independent advice outside of its own council planning and engineering teams? Given that A, it is submitted by a council officer seeking to subdivide land that contains a very clearly purposed covenant, and B, the engineering and traffic responses have raised significant conditions that are at best questionable around design response. Are there conflicts present in the fact that the legal provider, Maddox, mentioned earlier, have acted for council on a range of matters, including our FOI case, and also for the landowner, who has no doubt used the firm in both a professional capacity as well as for this application? A significant number of questions we raised with the acting CEO regarding council's conduct remain unresolved in our minds. And we question whether these matters have been brought to the attention of the committee members and whether they have been critically, fully and independently investigated. The sustained decision not to release the internal ombudsman's report in any form further builds community suspicion. These matters will be raised with integrity agencies and the local government inspectorate if satisfactory responses are not provided and council proceeds to support this application. My objection raises significant concerns regarding the nature of the conditions that the planning officer has been provided from the departments at council that are in the effective control of the developer relating to drainage and road access. The recommendations and consequential conditions on the permit are irregular. The recommendations uh, would appear as though they're creating conditions to try to validate a site that was never intended to be subdivided and is proving unsustainable. 
It is apparent, as outlined in the report, that it is not regular for land in this area to be subdivided and parent lots have not been disturbed. The intent of originally applying the covenant was purposeful and to suggest that one additional lot provides any meaningful impact on urban consolidation fails to recognise the intent behind the original subdivision or the broader intent of the COG planning scheme around its areas where housing change is actually designated. No provision has been considered which would embed on the title an obligation for the landowner or a successor in titles to pay a contribution for open space under the Subdivision Act for the entire parent allotment if the land were further subdivided. As a minimum, this creates a very significant perception of favourable financial treatment to the landowner if the land were further subdivided. Something that COG, despite what appears to be a clear covenant, cannot clearly guarantee against. Three of the teams who signed off on this permit work for the landowner at COG. Engineering services, waste services, park services. This is not a normal matter before your committee. Fundamental issues of governance and probity exist that give rise to your committee determining to refuse this application. A decision to do otherwise is not only in stark opposition to the community feedback and orderly and proper planning, but also further damaging to the public perception of council's reputation. You almost oh. completed on your submission. How long have you got to go? Um, well, it's about 12 to 13 minutes in total because there are four of us. So, so I've only got you speaking for Meredith, um, Janine, for, which is Kevin, and I've got you speaking for Brendan, Fernando, yourself and Susan. Uh, no, Trevor, Ali, I'm speaking. So Kevin spoke for Janine and Meredith. Um, yep. I'm speaking for, I already spoke for Fernando. Yep. And this presentation now is for four people. So that's myself, Trevor Elliott, Brendan Hicks and... Um, uh, Susan Arclay. But, um, okay, yeah, I'm about halfway through or further. All right, I've got Susan on here, so I'll give you another three minutes and then we need to then step into the others because I don't have them on my list as um, wanting to come to speak to the planning committee. Oh, okay. Well, so, they, did, they did email the, the organiser and they listed right. me as their proxy. I'll, I'll, I'll give you a little bit more time and then we, we need to wrap it up. Yep, thank there you. There is a restrictive covenant. Landowner City Services Director and Phillip Island resident Guy Wilson-Brown knew this when he purchased the property. He objected against an almost identical proposal in his own street that he now proposes in my street. Now, and this, this was rejected by Bass Coast. They didn't issue the permit and it didn't even have a covenant. Wilson Brown's objection points were the same as ours, neighbourhood character and design. I might just skip forward. Kevin's already mentioned Planning and Environment Act saying you shouldn't grant a permit. Um, I'd like to point out the map of objectors on page 32 shows the many objectors in close proximity to the proposed subdivision who are burdened by and benefited by the covenant. Pursuant to the recent Victorian Supreme Court case of Verdulis and O'Donnell, where beneficiaries close to the burden land experience a tangible impact on amenity, the court held a restrictive covenant should not be overturned. And the developer lost this case. Honourable Justice Mukhtar said this was because the resident objectors were physically so close to the plaintiff's land. In this case, the landowner in St Albans Park has six objectors physically touching his land, so the covenant should not be overturned. Uh, landowner is the director in charge of streets and drainage. As mentioned, he proposes to redesign a council street and drainage for his own benefit, the very thing he's in charge of. His stormwater outfall is not a legal point of discharge as it proposes to traverse across objectors' driveways under council road pavement and discharge out the front of another objector's residence. And this is through a pumping system and these are prone to failure. Normal stormwater discharge in residential allotments is by gravity discharge. Oakwood Ridge already has ponding stormwater, resulting in flooding. No houses in Oakwood Ridge currently discharge to the swale drain in the court. They all discharge via drainage pipes to the rear of properties. Drainage should be contained at the front of Guy Wilson Brown's property or in the drainage connection where the, the house is currently draining, not under council streets and other neighbours' driveways and discharging out the front of objectors' houses. Plans to hold stormwater on site and pump it is extremely irregular in a residential area. Where will this on-site detention overflow go if there's a power failure? 
Power failure often happens in this area during a weather event, which will be more likely to occur in future given current electricity forecasts. It will go into Freeman Court as it has previously and one uh, councillor before was looking at the photos of when that happened on another occasion. A 10,000 litre tank will overflow in 15 minutes with 30 mil of rain and 30 mil of rain is quite common at the moment. This has not been addressed in the planning report. We do not have faith in council's engineering team who signed off on this. We have a team of engineers and drainage experts involved and this is an unheard of scenario. Now, um, regarding sewer, the landowner has no permission from the rear neighbour to build the proposed sewer maintenance structure to connect to the sewer reticulation. Kevin's already mentioned that, so I won't go through that again. This rear neighbour is actually an objector. I don't imagine he's going to give permission. He doesn't want to. He's worried he'll be bullied into it, but that's another story. Obviously, if he doesn't agree and they try to go underground, that's trespass to land. Um, the only other option would be then to go through the horse burials if he can't use the rear neighbour objector's sewerage pit to connect to the sewer reticulation. There is too much involved in this matter. It needs to be thoroughly investigated by external authorities unlinked to the landowner before making a decision. Um, we don't understand why council seems, not councillors, but council officers seem prepared to fight against its own rate paying residents at VCAT and elsewhere when we just want to uphold our existing covenant and our lifestyle. All right, I'm going to draw a little line there. We'll give some time for questions. Councillors, uh, questions for Kelly at this point. Councillor Maloney. Um, I just, you, you were beginning to touch on some of the, the impacts that would have as a result of, of this. Um, and you mentioned that the, the trespass and the, the drainage issue, um, I, I guess, it seems like a, a quite a complex issue. Did, did you want to express a little bit about how how that's going to impact? Um, you, you're about to, to finish something there about your the amenity. Um, do, you, do you want to comment on that? I just wanted to hear. Yeah. Well, um, basically, the the proposal for the sewerage is is irregular, as I mentioned. Um, so uh, and for the drainage. So uh, we touched on this also with Fernando's um, discussion. Uh, the proposal is to run um, under neighbours' driveways under the council road and discharging the swale drain down the road in front of another person's house. And this is irregular and unheard of. Um, it's not normal to be using the pump system in a residential area. They are prone to failure. Uh, it is an area that may not be on the flood report of 2018, but that might have been prior to La Nina. Um, but uh, having said that, the photos that you have in that, in that report were, were prior to 2018. And they actually came directly from 7 to 8 Oakwood Ridge, um, which abuts our property. Um, so a lot of vegetation and all sorts of other things needed to be put in, which would be removed for the, to build this extra house that they want to squeeze into the corner. Um, my amenity, I sleep like a few metres from where this likely house will likely be built. Um, and the neighbour's amenity, I mean, there are more people here from Oakwood Ridge tonight who will, who will be able to discuss it, but um, their street already gets like heavy, um, like flooding when, there's, when there are rain events. So, and the fact that, um, like to say it's not going to affect their amenity, but their whole street's going to be redesigned just to suit this. When Kevin did his recording, that was before, um, it's no longer going to be a court bowl, it's going to be a T. A T. It's currently a ridge, it's proposed now to become a T. So either way, their street has to be redesigned with all the associated works and, and everything for this man's subdivision. Um, and that's obviously going to affect their amenity. It's going to cause likely extra flooding down the street. Um, it's, it's, the sewerage is another aspect because the sewerage he's proposing would have to go to the sewer maintenance pit in the rear neighbour's backyard. He doesn't have to give permission for that. And that's the only way he can connect to the sewer reticulation. That rear neighbour does not have to give permission for that. Um, th that's his choice, but he is an objector to this. Um, so I don't imagine he, I can't see why he would yeah. give permission. Yeah. But he thought he, he thought he would be pressured into it. They were, they, those were his words. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, I guess with respect to the, the irregular sewerage um, output um, or pumping of it, um, so 
I guess from a planning perspective, if, if this were to go ahead and a, another dwelling be added to, the, I guess as, as per the proposal, um, it would re require some of those um, steps to be it, to enable it essentially, which you're you're stating that they wouldn't be forthcoming. So, so there there wouldn't potentially be a, an ability to to drain into that. Or, or there wouldn't be a solution without that, those permissions. Is that is that correct? Can anyone clarify that? Well, water who would be dealing with that, and I'm not sure of their processes with who can access each other's um, easements. I'm not sure. We'd need, do you know, Bar and Water strange, requirements when it comes it's to a, access? At the moment, it's a requirement of the of the planning permission. The recommendation of the officers is a condition in there. Is that right, Peter? Yeah, so what we're proposing is a permit's issue. Can you speak into the microphone a yeah, bit more? Sorry. Thank you. That's okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I've, yeah, we're proposing that a permit's issued and there's a number of conditions that need to be satisfied. So I guess we can't guarantee that some of those conditions can be satisfied, particularly where um, it's a, you know, some, somewhere like bow and water. So we don't control the sewerage system. Um, so we leave it to bow and water to work out what the requirements are for this two-lot subdivision in terms of sewer. Thank you. Councillor. Our role to, um, to manage that aspect apart from refer to a condition that refers to them. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor. Councillor Nelson. Um, my questions to the officers again about that sewage. Um, the, the, the sewage pits aren't owned by the resident, they're owned by Bar and Water. It's their infrastructure, is that right? Yeah, they're, they're the RA, that's correct. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, so they can access the sewage whenever they like. Yeah. Um, and my other question was um, with regard to what Councillor Maloney said. Um, they're not pumping the sewage, they're pumping the, the stormwater, is that right? The it's proposed, yeah, to pump the stormwater. Storm we don't know the process with the sewage. I know it sounds quite odd, yeah. but the, they do need to get further consent from Barwon Water for the sewage, as we've discussed. But you're right, they're pumping the, uh, the water. I'm having um, problems in Belmont with um, water into back lanes because the over the. Councillor Nelson, the line, can you just speak into the microphone? Sorry. I'm having issues in the same issue in Belmont um, where they've got drains in the back going out to the to the um, the the point of discharge is is, is higher than than the block themselves, so they're having to pump there as well. So it's, it's not that it's irregular, it's just that it's... It's just a way of dealing with the sloping site, um, putting it, yeah, having to use a pumping system to get that water up, yes. yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Councillor Nelson. Councillor Mason. Councillor Grisbeck, I might need your guidance on this question. Um, but my question is to the officers, and it's related to probity. And since that this subject has been quite emphatically raised today. Uh, can, can you speak to the processes that have been taken to ensure distance in this case? I'll, I'll allow the question, because I think that's a fair question. Yes, yep. so this is a planning permit, a separate new planning permit from what was um, maybe previously, um, that has been withdrawn. Um, so I guess anyone can apply for a planning permit. The permit runs with the land, not the person applying for it. In this case, um, St Quintin's um, has been the applicant who I've been dealing with. Um, so if a councillor was to apply for a planning permit or, um, you know, someone who played AFL football, um, we don't look at that. It's not a concern of ours. We just bring it back to the scheme and see how it complies. Um, so. I mean, in that way, um, there's that separation there. And if we were to have a relationship or know, know someone else, you know, if John applied for a planning permit and, you know, we'd have to be very, very sure that someone was assessing it who wasn't John's best mate. Um, but no, like, I don't know. I don't know him. I've never met, I've never met him. Um, and I've been dealing with the applicant, the permit applicant. Thank you. Thank you. Um, um, but just to persist further, because it is a probity issue, uh, I understand what you've said in terms of your department, but there were also issues raised within the engineering department, and therefore my question uh, 
is reflected about how distance uh, uh, and probity is ensured. And, and I'll just say this. The question you raise is for the Governance Department to take up with Councillor Mason, and I would be putting the questions to them. I didn't hear your answer. Could you speak more clearly? The questions you raised should be raised with our Governance Department, and you'll be best to put those questions to them. Thank you. Question, uh, the question that I think you're asking, Councillor Mason, is there um, uh, a, a wall, a Chinese wall kind of thing between, between departments or when it's got to do with someone? I think the integrity of officers um, is not in question here in the sense of a planning um, committee. We're, we're dealing with the planning committee and the planning subdivision, but um, that is for the CEO to determine if there is any... Um, improper behaviour, and that's for the um, officers to to deal with the CEO. Um, unfortunately, we can't litigate those particular things in this forum, but I appreciate where your question's going. Thank you. I, I felt it necessary to raise it, seeing, seeing it has been raised at this meeting. Absolutely. Councillor Maloney. Sorry, um, Madam Chair, can I, or Councillor Grisbeck, I, yep. I think we should clarify that um, the, the section in the officer's report where it said no council officer has a conflict, that's not very well worded. Like a, that's, what it's trying to say is no officer involved in the preparation of the report has a conflict. So it's clearly incorrect to say that no, no council officer throughout the whole council has a conflict in this matter right. because the owner is a council officer. So I just wanted to put that on the record that we're not pretending that that's not the case. It's just, it should have had an extra few words in it to report, clarify. Yeah. So the report says that no council officer involved in um, drawing the report up has a conflict. It, it, it doesn't say that, but that's what it should say. <laughs> right, okay. Councillor Maloney. Thank you. Um, I, I have, a, I guess, there's a few unknowns in this, and, and I guess uh, to Councillor Mason's question, um, Perhaps we might need to seek some advice from governance because I can see that, as you mentioned before, you know, some football star or councillor, we're, we're not directly paying uh, individuals and maybe this uh, person isn't either, but uh, there's, there's a line management issue uh, and a power distance issue and a, a perceived conflict is just as real as, as a real one, but I guess we don't really have, I mean, we can assume but perhaps we need clarification before making a decision on this, is, is my um, comment at this stage. I'm not sure if other councillors are feeling confident about that. Or All right. perhaps, um, I, th I think we might he hear the rest of the objections and then the applicant, and then we may, may want to discuss that uh, at some point. If that's all right, Councillor Maloney, we'll just hold that. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Uh, councillors, any other questions for Kelly while she's with us? No? Thank you very much, Kelly. I'm going to call on Craig. Craig, are you here? Yep. Thank you very much. Thanks for taking the time out, Kelly, and speaking on behalf of the others as well. Thank you. Welcome, Craig. What we'll try and do is not go across things that have already been said, but uh, feel free to go. It's difficult. I know. Because, uh, I think there's some important points being raised there, and um, but I'll keep it short. Thank you very okay. much, Craig. So, um, yeah, thanks for having us in today. I, I'm hoping that the council is here uh, I've come with an open mind and also a sympathy to the fact that we're residents, we're not across, you know, the rules and regulations, we're just here in good faith to try and look after what we think is important in our neighbourhood, straight up. Um, the sort of things that are concerning me around this proposal, I've really got four things to talk about. They've all been mentioned, so I'm just going to briefly go over them. Um, the idea of um, neighbourhood character, I think, is often given a low priority in these settings. I'm asking you to raise that priority in your minds. Um, it's a significant issue for the current residents who pay rates, have bought into the um, estate in good faith, thinking that that lifestyle that they've um, invested into would remain. We're not talking about a suburb here, we're not talking about the estate, we're talking about the the, the neighbourhood. You know, the current proposal, it sounds big. A thousand metres square sounds like a big block. But when you consider the fact that in our little court there of um, seven blocks, they range from 1,600 metres roughly to 3,400 or 500 metres roughly. The average block size is 2,433 
square metres, a thousand seems quite small. So I think these things are really important to keep in mind that that's the sort of neighbourhood that we see in our area. Stormwater drainage issue is novel and interesting. A lot of effort's been put into, you know, to dishing up a solution to a, to a major problem. Take a walk down our street, come and have a look. We have open, shallow drains in the street. They have a very shallow fall. When water pulls them, they don't move away quickly. They're not designed for that. The original intention of those drains are there to capture water off the road surface. Nothing more than that. Pumping a whole house load of storm water down, that, um, down those channels would cause all sorts of risks around pooling water, degradation to the roadside, the nature strips, dangerous road edges, vehicles, blocking culverts. Those, our nature strips are really difficult to even mow when they're wet because they have a, a bit of a slope on it, they're soft surfaces, and they could even become dangerous. I suggest if you pump a heap of water through there, that's only going to make that harder. It's, it's an unsatisfactory and poorly thought out solution. Drainage in that area should be underground, gravity fed, like the rest of the blocks. Likewise, the uh, end of court road work, significant work. We're not just talking about putting a driveway in or a bit of a pipe here and there. We're talking about major road works at the end of the court. Um, it's going to impact not on my property, but on three properties significantly. It's going to bring traffic, trucks, etc., a lot closer to people's homes. Again, affecting the neighbourhood character, and it's not what we bought into that area to, to live amongst. I mean, that solution around building extra roads basically acknowledges that the court wasn't designed for that level of traffic or servicing. It just wasn't. It's a quiet cul-de-sac that has seven... Um, properties with the street address and only five that actually front the street. I'm also wondering about in terms of the um, stormwater drainage and also the uh, end of court road construction, that liability in the future. Who pays for the road surface in the future if the developer builds it but it falls apart in five years' time? Likewise with the drainage down the street. If that causes um, prob problems for properties downstream of that flow, who carries the liability about that? Do we go back to the developer or the owner and ask them to pay, or does that fall back on council? Has that been thought out? I didn't see anything in the, in the proposal about that. I'm also going to mention what you don't want me to mention, and that is, um, I think it's remarkable at this day and age that a person who is employed as a director of a service in the Shire has even contemplated an action where they are likely to profit in circumstances where there is potentially a conflict of interest, in particular, gaining unfair advantage through their position. These days, it's not good enough for councils to have protocols and policies that simply deal with integrity issues if seen. It's good to have those, but it's not enough. Society expects councils, for example, and other organisations to have policies and protocols that ensure that in all circumstances, the gaining of unfair advantage is removed. The bar's been raised now, and without this, public trust in organisations such as councils is at risk. In this case, the potential for gaining unfair advantage uh, is high. Things like access to advice, information, influencing decisions either directly or even subtly, other decisions down the chain impacting by knowledge that this is the boss's place. The director oversees waste services, they've signed off on it. Engineering services, they've signed off on it. Park services, they've signed off on it. What about the current proposal for roadworks? Who will Craig, do the work? I'll, I'll just ask you to wrap up if that's yep, all right. I will wrap up in about a minute. Contractors, are the contractors past, current or potentially future recipients of council tenders? There's a lot of potential here for things to go wrong. Yesterday I did speak to someone from governance who assured me from their point of view that nothing untoward had taken place in relation to the director's involvement in the subdivision application. They went on to explain to me that the, in the council context, conflict of interest is dealt with by the individual self-assessing the potential for conflict of interest in the work they do. 
I would suggest that the director has made a very poor self-assessment about the potential for conflict of interest, and in this case, has prioritised their own personal financial gain above community confidence and trust in the decision-making process of the council. Thank you, Craig. Councillor Zinni, Craig, we might just get you to stay in case the councillors have a question for you. <coughs> councillors. Councillor Nelson. Um, you talk about neighbourhood character, um, yep. and that's something that's certainly big um, for me uh, in, in my, my patch. Um, so you're talking about just the street or... Okay, yeah, so, so I think um, I... Because I'm looking at the map here. Sure. I'm looking at, at, at houses that are like probably 300 square metre yeah. blocks there. So in our context, well, I think we've got a suburb, St Albans Park. It has quite a number of distinct sections. There's a part that used to be Whittington. There's sort of... And you've sort of got newer parts as it evolved. We've got the estate of St Albans Park, which was built around the old stud. That's what we're in. Mm. And then we've got a subsection of that down in the south where we live, which is what I'd call my neighbourhood, which is the part that was deliberately designed as a low density living area. And so that's the part, that's what I would call my neighbourhood. I'm looking at Homestead Drive and there's uh, what I'm assuming is three, um, three houses on one block there. It probably has been a subdivision, I would say, if that's the case. That, 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 that section set, the southern section of the suburb, you can clearly see that it's predominantly uh, large blocks. And as I said, in our, in our street, in our court, um, we've got range, you know, sizes ranging from 1,600 to basically 3,500 square metres with an average block size of 2,433. Three. Yeah, I wrote that, yep. Yeah, yep. good. Okay. Um, and and I'd, I'd suggest, with regard to unfair advantage, that's why we're here. Um, Guy obviously hasn't rung me. Um, I know who he is. Um, I just see there's another officer in in the room as well. So you would you would probably argue that they might have a conflict of interest um, with regard to this. Um, it's certainly an interest, that's for sure. Uh, they, um, um, sorry, but but I think we're here to to decide on this. So the the unfair advantage in my mind disappears because I I, I don't care who the application's for, I'm, I'm here to decide on that. Yeah. So. No, 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 and I do understand. And that was outlined at, the, at the start of the meeting. Yeah, yeah I understand that, but yeah. I just want to have my say anyway, so... Yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks. thanks. Nelson? Councillor Mason? Well, I have a question related to what you just stated about what the intent of the subdivision was originally, but I just would like the officers to uh, uh, reinforce or explain that the land is actually zoned now as a general residential schedule one. And uh, perhaps what that means and how long has that been in, in force? Oh, I don't know how long it's been in force. It was there when the previous application was made that has since been withdrawn. Um, so it, mean, it means it's, a, it's not a low density residential zone. It is a general residential zone and there's no minimum lot sizes there. Um, I'm not sure how long it would have been zoned that. Maybe the original subdivision? I, I couldn't tell you exactly, but yeah, it's, it's always been in um, a general residential or similar zone, as far as I'm aware. So since it was subdivided, I imagine it's been in a fairly standard residential zone. There are a few of, um, estates like that, of that vintage where the lots were created quite large. It's a bit like the one in Warren Ponds. Um, I can't think of its name, off Gazapur Road. So there are some um, large lots in the general residential zone. It's pretty uncommon, but yeah, this one mm. has just been through a series of similar zones in the past. They change the name every few years, the state government, but it hasn't been come from a rural living zone or anything like that. It's, it's generally been in that So zone. if I understand your, your response, it's been a general residential zone for quite a long time. That's public knowledge for quite a long time. And that has um, <coughs> limited restrictions. I didn't. Can you re reinforce that again? Yeah, the zones. It's kind of off-the-shelf residential zone. The general residential zone, Schedule One. Um, so there's a hierarchy of zoning. The neighbourhood residential zone is um, more restrictive. Then you've got the general residential zone, and then you've got the residential growth zone. They're the three sort of conventional residential zones. So it's just in the middle there is a fairly standard zone. I, I suppose the unusual thing here is there is a, a covenant or some sort of restriction on title which has been addressed by the officer. Um, but, yeah, it's got unusually large lots for a general residential zone 
the southern part of this estate. I think that's pretty obvious when you look at the maps. Um, but to say about the zone, it's pretty standard, really. Councillor Nelson? Just further on Councillor Mason's point. So, so there's no minimum lot size, though? No. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Craig, for your submission. Uh, Joanne, thank you. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you Joanne. Um, excuse me, Kylie, one of our um, fellow objectors um, was here earlier. He had to go because he got notification of a family medical emergency. He's asked me, this is David Newton, um, he's asked if this could be read. He's, um, Objection could be read. At this stage, we'll probably just take the, the submissions that we've got in person now, because we, we weren't aware of that, but um, we'll, we'll, we need to get through to um, the ex next stage as well. So, Joanne, if you wouldn't mind just doing yours, that would be great. Thank you. So council knows that St Albans Park comprises two distinctly different areas. There's a northern high-density living area and a southern low-density living area and you will see that the proposed 1,000 metre block is still significantly smaller than the large blocks in the southern area of the suburb. And Council should know that the application is incompatible with the low density southern area and directly threatens the neighbourhood character. Council should know that the risks associated with the, pro uh, no, the, risks associated with the proposed stormwater drainage. Oakwood Ridge only has open drains with water that pulls for days. There is a long-standing pre-existing drainage problem which won't be solved by the proposed stormwater drainage. Directly affected residents want to know that the decisions made in relation to the proposed subdivision will be made solely in the interests of the community who purchase their properties in good faith under the covenant. Thank you very much. Councillors, uh, questions for Joanne? Uh, Joanne, I've got a question for you. Um, in relation to, uh, so all, all of the objectors, sort of we've got a, the map of where all the objectors from, your particular um, residence in Oakwood Court? Yes. Yes, okay. That's all, thank you. Uh, the, Brendan. Is Brendan, oh, you're Brendan, sorry, yes, you are. Uh, any other, uh, besides David, what we might do is just, um, if we've read all the objections, but if you wouldn't mind circulating that, so whilst we're uh, contemplating, count, starting with Councillor Mason, and we can circulate that around so it gets read. Um, all right, so that's all of the objectors at this point. So I will ask Brendan to come up, please, on behalf of the applicant, um, and come through to the microphone. Thank you, Brendan. Welcome. Thank you, Councillor. I do have a, a couple of handouts that I would like to distribute, if, if you don't mind. Sure, just grab them. We can circulate them while, we, while you're speaking. Thank you. This is just a, a layout of the subdivision. Just makes it a little bit clearer to, to read, I think. It's on an A3. Uh, there's no changes um, to the proposal. Just quickly run through, run through, oh, did everyone? Sorry, it's getting handed uh, you, around. You start, we'll, we'll It's getting handed yeah. around, that's fine. Sure. I just find there's a lot of misinformation with this application, and I find it's real easy for um, objectors to throw out information when it's not, it's not, it's, it's technical, and they're providing a lot of assumptions, I find. But I'll just run through a few of them that I've heard. Um, so in terms of the on-site, in terms of drainage, um, the conditions of this application require on-site detention. So, and, and how it's written, the condition, is that when a building is eventually built on that lot, it will be detained in, it will be engineered and detained with a rainwater tank. Now, it doesn't have to be 10,000 litres. It will be the size that it needs to be to detain the water that falls onto the roof. So at the moment, the reason we don't provide on-site detention the moment it's subdivided is because we're not providing any more hard surfaces. So that, that water will just run off as it is now. So once a house is built on there, um, 
That will be detained within a rainwater tank. It will be utilised by the household and, um, and then it will be discharged slowly out. So after, generally, after a large rain event, um, it will be discharged out. But that, that I mean, rainwater tanks are used um, universally uh, to detain water because there's no other way to detain water. You can have oversized pipes um, or rainwater tanks. And, and this is the, the engineers have asked for, asked for rainwater tanks. It's part of the condition. Um, so that's part of the section 173. Uh, the, in terms of a, in terms, so, okay, so rainwater hits the, hits the roof, it gets detained within a rainwater tank, it will discharge out, it will be used by the owner. Now there's other parts of the land that rain obviously will settle on, and how is that going to be discharged out? Now at the moment we've got a, if you can see on your plan, so at the northern end of, of, of lot, proposed lot one, it shows a gravity piped drain. Now that is our proposal, to get it gravity um, fed out if you look at where the, the court bowl is, that's actually going underneath the court bowl, so it's not going to be running over people's driveways, and it's going to be discharged into the swale. Now, we've said it's gravity piped, it's very flat. Council engineers have basically given the option at thir condition 13, um, sorry, not 13B, uh, 13C, that allow, so they, they think it will be pump system, but it does allow, if we can prove it, that it will be gravity fed. So it's gravity fed or a pump system. Whatever, however, uh, we need to make sure that we can get, um, have the fall that gets out to that swale. Okay, so in terms of the swale, that, I mean, uh, one of the uh, <coughs> comments I heard was the swales are, you know, they get filled up and they get a little bit muddy. There's no doubt that, that they do. I mean, everywhere at the moment in Geelong is wet. Um, these swales aren't just for roads. There's, there's, drain, there's drainage in this estate through um, at the back of people properties, swales within the roads. This all discharges, it's meant to discharge to the detention basin which is at the south east of the estate. Now if you just switch over your page, I do have a photo of the detention basin. That was taken, that photo was taken yesterday. You can see it's, there's, not, there's no water in it. So uh, after all the rain that we've had over the last few weeks, there's plenty of capacity within this um, detention basin to capture that water. Now, a lot of it's still in the swales and it will eventually get there. And I understand it gets a little bit muddy, but everywhere in Geelong, there's no new cut, everywhere in Victoria. So a couple other points. Uh, sewer, we absolutely do not need to get um, agreement from an owner to, to connect into sewer. That is a Barwon water asset. And I, and I, I just, don't know where that comment came from. There's already an easement, so if you go back to the front page in the uh, southeast corner, so that's the E1, and if you look on our little inset there, we've got existing drainage and sewer easement. There's already a sewer main at that point. We can connect in to there with bar and water um, approval. <coughs> now, uh, Councillor Nelson, you asked a question about um, whether that has to be gravity fed. Sewer always has to be gravity fed with from your house down to the sewer main. That's why sewer mains are so deep, because um, it, it allows every house to make sure that it can get the appropriate fall. So even though this is flat, because that sewer main is so deep, we, we can easily get that fall um, to reach and gravity f and, and gravi gravity piped into that sewer main, which is existing. So as you can see back on that front page, I mean, we've shown the tree. There's, it's got an inventory number now. Um, we all, I think we all accept that, Victor Heritage Victoria went out there. Um, we've had written correspondence from HV saying that we don't need permission to, for this subdivision because there's going to be no tangible impact on this tree or any area around it. Um, now, it could be, there could be burials. Uh, this was an old stud fund. There's probably burials, hundreds of burials throughout this, it didn't, didn't bother people when they built these homes um, all those years ago. But what I would say is that there's a regulation within the Heritage Victorian Act. It doesn't matter whether you're in Myers Street, Mallop Street, St Kilda Boulevard, St Kilda Road, sorry, Oakwood Ridge, if you come across remains, you've got an obligation to inform um, the appropriate authority. So to say that there could be horse remains within the proposed easement that sewer easement that we're, we're showing, um, I mean, there could be. There could be human remains there. There could be anything. Um, but that, 
there's a protection across the entire state of Victoria for that. So contract, contractors, that, they're all aware of that. And, and um, yeah, so just throwing out comments that there could be horse remains there, I don't think it assists anybody. But as you can see, we're keeping well away from the, the tree. Well, I've showed a bit of a building envelope there. Now, that, that's not part of a restriction or anything. It was just to give you some, cons some idea about the spacing between buildings. Now, that doesn't appear from, from my eye that there's any irregularity in terms of spacing. You can see the large houses that, some of the, that are around this estate. Um, and this kind of just fits in. It's, it's a good 20 or so metres from the, um, from the existing house on lot two. And there's, I mean, it's close to a garage, a couple of garages, but um, there's sufficient distance and separation. Um, the last, just on this front page, I mean, we're, we're proposing a court bowl to sort, I mean, this is to sort out the waste services. Um, I mean, you've got, um, so the, the waste trucks go in there and it's a really awkward situation for them to, um, reverse and, and get around. So we've, we're trying to improve this situation. Um, it's a very unusual, I'd say, it's very unu unusual, the existing situation. Um, so this is definitely an improvement, I would have thought. And I think the first um, uh, gentleman, he was speaking on behalf of everyone in that court, even though he doesn't live on that court, but he said no one wanted the court, but uh, I'm not sure if anyone else said that. <coughs> Um, so just back to a couple other comments, there's definitely no cultural heritage management plan required. Um, uh, there's as <coughs> Emma was saying, there's exemptions and it's not even in the sensitivity area. But again, that Heritage Victorian Act requires, if, if, uh, um, if something is uh, found within that, uh, within any, any build, within the construction of the dwelling, uh, we need to, they need to inform authorities. Um, let's talk about sewer. Uh, Pump system, that's fine, great. I won't pick up too much time. I mean, so, I mean, I've talked about the high value tree. Um, look, I was involved in the first application from 2019, I think it was, but obviously uh, there's uh, avoidance of anything near that tree um, is in the best interests uh, of, of what could be there. So we have, we have modified that. So the tree won't be touched at all, as you can see on that page. Um, in terms of the covenant in section 173, look, you find these section, these kind of restrictions all over the place in the in estates that were built in the 1990s. Now, my firm did this estate. It's, you know what, planning wasn't as strong back in 1992. This was, 92 was the endorsed, I've got the endorsed plan of subdivision. And uh, that's why those sort of covenants were on there. And it's too, unless uh, otherwise um, approved by the RA, um, just allows that extra level of protection that they wanted back then. But planning regulation is really strong now, and um, you need to have, for every subdivision in Victoria, you need to have an approval by, the, by council. So it's a given. So, but as we've got legal advice saying that both of those uh, covenants in the section 173 do not prohibit this at all. Um, I, I believe that you've been given a copy of that, and, and it's quite, um, I believe it's quite straightforward. Uh, detention I basin I've talked in. about. I might just ask you to wrap. Yes, wrap okay, up. no problem. Uh, lot sizes, sorry. Um, yes, I just wanted to show you lot sizes. So just on the final page, um, I've just identified the site. This is from a land checker source. So the first, uh, on the top of the page, it shows lots under 2,000 square metres in the St Albans estate area. You can see how many there are. I mean, our, our, our lots, I mean, we've got one at... 2,400, one at 1,013. And then in the bottom part, part of the page, lots, oh, that should be lots under 3,000, excuse me. Um, and you can see how many lots are under 3,000. So these lot, the majority of the St Albans estate, I mean, they're the, the, um, <laughs> pretty consistent, I would have thought, with what we're proposing. Uh, and yeah, I mean, so just in conclusion, the proposal's, pr um, it's, I think it's assisting and consolidating um, the existing urban fabric, makes use of existing infrastructure. Victoria's getting larger. We've got the Commonwealth Games in a couple of years. More people are wanting to live here. More people are living here. We need to provide lots. We can't just say one lot is, is not going to assist. Every lot assists. Um, and therefore, I believe the officer recommendations should be upheld.
Thank you, Brendan. Thank uh, you. I might start with a question if that's all right. So the the sewer on this map, so the one that goes right at the length of the property, so the 2.5 metre E6 sewer, is that the current sewer or that's the proposed sewer? As a proposed sewer right. <coughs> main, so you need a sewer main from going from the edge of lot one yep. all the way down to lot two. Right, to, um, to discharge it in E1. Into E1. Absolutely. Right. So there's currently buildings uh, located over that proposed sewer. Are they proposed to be demolished? Are they proposed to stay, go under? What's the... Oh, have to be removed. Removed. Yeah, to, to, so it's a shed. To facilitate. It's a shed that will need to be removed at the back there? Okay, and how will that affect those uh, neighbouring property in terms of, because you're saying it's quite a deep sewer that they need to, how do we know um, that that won't affect the properties next door? Well, it's all, all within a main, so there's no, there's no works required in any other properties. The only works that are required are within the proposed easement and a new pit will be created at that E1 to connect into. I, I don't see how there's any construction works needed on any other mains. There's no issue with, um, you know, when you're building sewers about like the, the boundary, like the fall, there's no issues about land collapsing in. I, we've had quite some of those issues down my way in, in, in Lara, so I just wanted to make sure that that's the proposal is not to um, do it right on the on the edge of this. It's, it's a setback into oh, the land. So the new main, yeah, sorry, yep. uh, the new main which goes up that uh, what would you call that the so, eastern boundary? Yep. Um, e E six goes all that. There are new, will be a new main constructed and laid. It does. So it's a two point five meter easement. It's usually offset by about a meter from the property boundary. But it's just a trench system. I don't believe there's. I mean. I can't see how that's going to have impact on foot. There's not going to be impact on any footings um, because they're all going to be maintained within um, the neighbour's property. Thank you. Councillor Mason. Thanks, Councillor Ms. Mick. Um, could you tell us a little bit more about the cul-de-sac and the uh, changes that have to be made uh, with the engineering works? I don't quite understand uh, the original road situation and how it now appears uh, on our, the current plan you've shown us. Yes, so at the moment it's, it's kind of a three-prong um, construction. I'm not, are, are, you, are you able to see the existing situation? I'm not sure if that's it. Yes, I can see it. Yeah, page uh, 15 of the officer's report of the agenda. No, it's only, it's only reconstruction in the cul-de-sac area. That's right, the road, uh, so where the road um, reserve, sorry, where the um, seal of the road ends and starts to prong out into those three prongs, that's when a court bowl will be constructed all within the road reserve. So if you look on my plan that I handed out, the, it's kind of an odd shape at the end, that's all within the road reserve. So none of those are going to be impacted on the lot boundaries and we're providing, we're, we're asked to provide a court bowl that will assist in um, not only turning around for for, uh, for vehicles, but also for waste, mainly for the for the um, council waste services. Mason, thank you, Councillor Nelson. Thank, um, my question is probably to the officers, but it's with regard to what um, has been presented, um, and it's with regard to the, the lot size. I'm looking at the at the plan, at the entrance to the court, the two houses that are right that abut that court right on the corner of um, the Homestead Drive and Oakwood Ridge, that they're less than 2,000 square metres. Roughly, how, roughly how, how big are they? The one to the north is 1,616. The one to the south is 1,679. Thank you. Thank you, <laughs> Councillor Nelson. for your Thanks. questions, Councillor. Uh, Councillor's questions further for Brendan? All right, thank you, Brendan, very much. We'll now um, debate this. What I might just do quickly, Councillor Maloney, is I might just seek some advice quickly. Um, and so I'll just be a couple of minutes, if that's all right. Thank you.
Just wait for Councillor Maloney to come back. <laughs> One down the street, is she? All right, Councillor Maloney is on her way back. Um, so just uh, to be very clear, the questions that I... Sorry, Councillor Maloney, I'll start with you. Uh, the questions that I uh, asked the officers was to make sure that they um, individuals haven't had conflict of interest and that was very clearly made to me. Councillor Mason, um, the question was asked particular officers whether they had a conflict or whether they had spoken to um, uh, the officer involved and there was very clearly uh, no and um, their integrity is something that we hold here at the council so we need to make sure that from our perspective we are dealing with this particular matter as a planning matter as it sits before us. Um, so councillors I'm going to invite debate uh, or questions uh, and any comments from you at this particular time. Councillor Asher. Thank you. Thank you for um, chairing so neatly, Councillor Grisbeck. It's been um, an interesting um, set of submissions and thank you all for your time as well um, and the contributions you've made. Look, planning by nature, I said it's all about process and controls, but it's also subject to interpretation, which is where we end up with differences of opinion and I've always believed that compromises are possible. The 45 objectors to the idea of destroying a tree and the change of the easement location is a really good example of a compromise. And there are obviously other objections here that are policy-based and quite legitimate. However, on balance, the officer has confirmed that it does satisfy the planning scheme. So it is a tricky one. Um, for me, the historic process issues aren't ideal and I'm particularly uncomfortable with perceptions about transparency or lack of transparency. And I'm not convinced that anything inappropriate has happened here, but there are a number of factors that have raised concerns clearly enough to generate a lot of passion from the objectors. And I do appreciate the work that's been done by the team, but on this occasion, I'm not supportive of the recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Asher. Any other councillors wish to make comment at this point? And then we might ask for a recommendation. Councillor Nelson. Thanks. Um, yeah, yeah. I certainly came in here with an open mind tonight. Um, I've, to be honest, I've flipped and flopped a few times uh, about this application with regard to what people have said, um, because it's it's certainly not clear cut. I think the the neighbourhood character issue, a um, thousand square metres, is good. I think that's fine. I think most people in Geelong. If they, if they could have a 1,000 square metres, they'd be pretty happy with that. Um, I, I struggle to understand, the, I know the area pretty well, so I struggle to un understand the argument about this north-south debate when the actual homestead itself is in the north um, and, and those block sizes at, at the start of the, the court um, are less than 2,000 square metres anyway. Um, the drain, the, the easement drain, um, was, was answered, and I think that's that's good. Um, 45 objections. Are, are they all are they all in the, this neighbourhood as well? I'm not sure that you get 45 houses there. So, um, but the issue I have um, is, is is about probity and about how this looks, um, and I think we probably need it. Probably needs to be decided by by VCAT if that's what how it goes. Um, so, like Councillor Asher, um, I, I, I can't support it either. So, um, I think on a planning, I think planning perspective, I think it looks it's fine, but it's just just the, the perception. Um, so, I won't be supporting this. Thank you, Councillor Nelson. I might then, if there, might ask if we might move a, a, a recommendation, if there's anybody that wants to move it, and then we can debate that as we go. So, uh, Councillor Asher. I'm happy to move an alternate recommendation that the responsible authority, having considered all matters which the Planning and Environment Act 1987 requires it to consider, decides to refuse to grant a planning permit for a lot 
two lot subdivision at 7 to 8 Oakwood Ridge, St Albans Park, in accordance with the plans and documentation submitted with the application on the following grounds. The subdivision does not accord with clause 56035, neighbourhood character, as the proposed lot sizes do not respect the existing neighbourhood character. And two, the subdivision does not accord with clause 6502, approval of an application to subdivide land. The new lot is not reflective of the subdivision pattern in the area. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there a seconder for Councillor Asher's alternate motion? Councillor Nelson. So, uh, Councillor Asher, would you like to speak to your alternate? I, I'm happy to um, hand over to Councillor Nelson. Thank you. Um, Councillor Nelson. Yeah, not much other than what I've said before. Um, I think this probably needs to be decided by external um, people just to make sure that everything um, that you've raised um, will, will be looked into. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, who else? Anyone? C Councillor, sorry, that was a bit stuttery, wasn't it? Councillor Mason. Um, thanks, Kat. Uh, Councillor Grisbeck. Look, I, I uh, find this a very difficult issue in that I, I feel that uh, on, on many of the um, planning circumstances, I, I feel the criteria have been met. Um, uh, and um, uh, I, I do uh, express confidence in all of the different um, uh, authorities that have, have made their considered recommendations. However, uh, and I also have confidence in the officers and in our city uh, administration, but when we talk about probity, it's not only justice being done, it's appearing to be done. And so in that sense, I, I find some discomfort and uh, agree with uh, Councillor Nelson's uh, assessment that uh, uh, it should be, um, this decision should be made at arm's length. So um, uh, that's where I stand. Thank you, Councillor Mason. Malone, did you, no? Well, sure. Uh, I, is that an echo? Um, I also would like to support the um, alternate recommendation as I feel, as I'd mentioned before, there is need for further investigation as to um, the concept of conflict of interest is a real tricky one, and even if you state that there is none, there there still is a perceived conflict and potentially an actual conflict. Um, and I believe that that in this case, uh, there the simple notion of not receiving an FOI when it's requested uh, rings alarm bells for me. Um, and I've heard that since I've been a councillor in my very short time compared to other folks here. Um, I, I believe that there is an unseen or unspoken pressure applied to anyone who has an indirect or direct line manager um, as an applicant. And I know that that might not seem like it's, you know, um, it's real. Um, however, power distance is a, is a very tricky and interesting thing to, tra to traverse. And I really respect and commend the officers who have um, probably gone through this with seven fine tooth combs and then some to try and make sure that this is getting, you know, this is the, you know, the right thing to do. There also are um, other issues at play that w we can't see and feel. And, and whether or not you're from a, a particular culture or your, or your upbringing says, you know, respect, you know, that, that certain authorities. Um, I feel very uneasy about this, um, especially given the, the nature of how uh, St Albans Park has developed, as Councillor Nelson really wisely put, that um, that it does seem a bit of an, an odd, out-of-character um, proposal. But but the the main issue here I have is the, the, the big uh, empty spots where we need information to make a, um, a very clear and transparent and correct decision. So I'm, I'm uh, supportive of the alternate. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Maloney. Um, I might just say a few, quick few words and, and look, it is it is regrettable um, and unfortunate that our Brown Bell councillors can't be here and they did send their apologies uh, to us. Um, it's circumstances and timing at this time of year, unfortunately. Um, I think what we've heard tonight, and to reiterate, um, that, that, you know, it, in my patch, if a thousand square metre block was considered uh, high, medium density, uh, we would probably be laughed at. So, uh, look, I think in terms of 
um, I guess, you know, in terms of you live there and you understand that area. Um, in general planning sense, though, that doesn't seem a, a unreasonable um, subdivision in, in general planning residential one. Um, I think what we've heard tonight is there's, there is some uncertainty and it's in a unique situation that we find ourselves in. Um, I think uh, we often as councillors come up against the neighbourhood character of an area and that's something that I guess I pride myself on listening to my community around their concerns around neighbourhood character. Um, you know, it's, in a planning sense, sometimes it's not necessarily seen because, you know, when I'm looking on a map, it, that those size lots look quite fine, but it does come down to, to the, the neighbouring residents telling me how they use that area and how they feel about their, their particular home. Um, I want to be really clear that um, I thank the officers for the report and the, and the discussions tonight, and I appreciate it's never easy uh, when there are other uh, issues abounding a normal planning committee um, meeting, uh, those of that were called into question tonight. So thank you for your uh, report and, and for being honest with us around there's no potential conflict. In saying that, um, I still feel a little uneasy, as, as Councillor Maloney had said, about making the decision, being the authority given um, that the applicant, who, who in my view has not been part of that, has done it through a, through a proxy, um, uh, is a senior officer of, of the city. So I'm not saying that there is conflict. What I'm saying is I feel uneasy about those uh, things that have been raised uh, in this forum. So for that particular reason, I'll be supporting the alternate motion. So. Councillor Sullivan, I'm going to throw it, if you didn't have anything further to add, we might put the matter to the vote. So, councillors, all those in favour of the alternate recommendation put by Councillor Usher. Okay, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. That's carried. Thank you very much for your time tonight for the applicant and also the objectors. Thank you very much. Thanks very much. Thank you so much. And that is the end of the live stream. If we can get the officers to quit the live stream, that would be great. Just remember, we're still on. Don't say anything just yet.